Hi everyone, today we talked about a career in coding. What's the best way to start? And even when you've started, what options are still out there and which roads can you take? And my guest Johan Jansson has had many different roles in his career, developer or even tech evangelist and now software architect. I really liked his perspective on the topic. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Enjoy. Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. Johan, welcome, man. Thank you. How's it going? Uh, very good. How about you? Cool, man. I'm, uh, I'm good as well. It's pretty early, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it should be good. Yeah, so I invited you on to talk about uh, a career in coding. Uh, because you have quite the career yourself, you've had kind of different roles. Uh, and I think if you start from university, uh, it's kind of hard to to find your way throughout um, the landscape that we have now, right? You have cloud, you have operations, you have DevOps. Um, even within development, you have kind of different aspects there. Uh, so I think it's pretty hard to navigate. But what? let's start off with, I'm a student and I come from university. I have a computer science degree or, or even not. Um, and I want to start somewhere. What is kind of the, the first step um, in landing that position where I can just get some work experience? What do you think there? Um, yeah, so I think the, the interesting part is that in, in when studying computer science or something like that, you learn a lot of valuable things, but yeah. it's, at least in my experience and what I heard from others, it's often not directly the things you do in a job. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a little bit of a, of a mismatch. So it's a bit looking like, yeah, where do you start and where do you learn the skills that you didn't learn in university or, or other environments? Um, myself, I, I had a graduation assignment and I did that at a company, which I was like, yeah, that, that looks like an interesting company. Um, I quite liked the graduation assignment and uh, I got my degree and then I stayed at that company. I already got a good view of it in the six months that I did my assignment there. Yeah, um, And then they had like, some different roles, uh, for instance, database administrators, uh, developers, and then you had Java developers and .NET developers, and uh, there were some more roles. And that company was more a Microsoft company, so the Microsoft mm. group was quite big and the Java group was a bit smaller. And I quite liked that. It felt a bit more familiar. You knew everyone. And yeah, I that didn't have a really big preference, but it was like, yeah, we're looking someone for the Java uh, department. Do you want to join that one? I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Um, and in that company, because uh, I, I can really advise if you start, search for a company that offers you proper education. Mm. Um, and so I was sometimes, uh, recruiters ask me like, yeah, do you want to join our company? We have really big budgets for studying. And then they say, yeah, we have a thousand euros for studying. Yeah, that's nice. But a thousand <laughs> euros for studying is like two or three days. Yeah. Um, at the company I joined, and, and there are multiple companies that do that. They have a whole plan for you. They, they teach you the Java language or whatever you're starting with uh, in a really broad scale. And in my case, I think it was like uh, two months of continuous studying. And then afterwards, once in a while, we got like a day of studying, yeah. uh, both technical, but also yeah, they call it social skills. Nowadays, you, some people say you shouldn't call it social skills. It's like skills you just <laughs> need, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to really find a company that offers that education, to, it makes the bridge from the things you learned in school to what you have to apply in your job a lot easier. Uh, I learned a lot about Java, uh, different Java frameworks, yeah. operating systems, databases, which I, I didn't know before. Um, and I think that helps to, to get started in, uh, in your new environment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I like that you take that kind of educational path, right? Because when your educational journey stops, is not when you stop learning, right? Even on the job, it's yeah. very important to learn on the job, but also beyond that, right? And getting that room in, in either a budget or just days off uh, to train yourself or, or to do that within a team, I think is very important to keep that kind of ball rolling uh, and keep learning on the fly. Uh, but those aspects, right, you already called it skills that you didn't learn necessarily in, uh, in a year's university uh, or in an educational journey. Um, I think they're more related to working together Right? Because a developer is not necessarily a one-man army. You're usually doing it within a team. Uh, but why, in, in kind of your educational journey, why is there not a focus on that in a, in a computer science degree? What do you think? Uh, I think it differs, because I, I had a focus on that in, in my education, uh, yeah. actually. So um, 
when I was studying computer science, the, sometimes you did assignments alone, sometimes with two or three. Yeah. But they also had like some sort of internal company, which was run by uh, uh, students of the, the higher years, basically. So they were directors and managers and stuff like that. Yeah. And when you started, you were a developer in that uh, company. And you mm. had teams of, I, I think it was f- between four and six or something like that. Um, you had to do an assignment for a real company yeah. uh, and you had like half a year for that and then a uh, couple of hours each week. It wasn't a half a year full time, yeah. uh, but it, it simulated like a real working environment and, and the higher you got in the company, the, the different your roles got. Uh, you became either the project leader from for one team or maybe you uh, tried to get new assignments from companies or, or things like that. So. Uh, I, th- I think that was a really good one because that had more of a feeling of a, of a real company yeah. um, and, and doing real stuff instead of, uh, I had a lot of courses in programming languages probably only used at that university. Yeah, and That's fun, but it doesn't help you uh, that much when you have to program in Java or .NET or something like that. So yeah. I think it differs and it, it is good, I think, if there is... Uh, uh, education is, is paying attention to the, the bridge because university I think traditional is more uh, about doing research after you get your degree yeah. but in reality uh, the ones going into research is only a small percentage I think most people go uh, working for a company yeah. uh, and work on like, practical things instead of uh, theoretical research yeah. um, and so I think then it's also good to make sure those people are also prepared uh, for that uh, yeah I like that it's already inherent in such a product project then that you do for a company. Yeah. That is kind of a real life example or a real world example mm-hmm. of how it's gonna be after you graduate. Right. And even then, let's say you started at a at a company. Uh, in your case you were a, a Java developer, but already there there's kind of the, the Java title, right? Or it's it's C sharp or it's Golang or, or whatever. There's a lot of different technologies that you first kind of cling on. Yeah. Right. But you also have to kind of let go of those if you want to try something else. Uh, or even let go of the developer title in itself. If you're more like, I want to do product management, that's more my thing. I like more of the planning, um, the stakeholder management, more of the uh, kind of people skills in that way. Mm-hmm. But how can you kind of navigate that for yourself if you have no clue where to start first um, and then no clue where you're heading, basically? Um, I think one of the best options there is if you have a company that offers uh, various roles because mm. that makes it easier to switch. You can do that within the company. You don't have to go to a, to another company. Yeah. Uh, so my first company, I stayed there for 11 years and I had like, I don't know, eight different function titles or something like that. Nice. Switching between various roles and then trying out things and then sometimes... Uh, you like to do things for, for a shorter period of time and then you're like, okay, now something else. Um, so having a company that supports that and is big enough to do that, I think makes it relatively easy. If you have to switch between companies every time, yeah, um, it's a bit harder. And yeah, like I said, I started with uh, with Java development and I quite like that. Uh, so started as a junior developer, then we call it, I think, media and then senior developer, or lead developer, um, and then let my own team um, and then gradually you, you also notice that when you start as a junior, you probably do mostly purely coding. Of course, you have some meetings, agile meetings or, or things like that. Yeah. Uh, but the higher you get in your role, the more you get communication with other stakeholders like the business or uh, with operations and stuff like that. So uh, you get a bit more responsibilities, not only focusing on purely coding, uh, but something I also find important is like the non-functional aspects like code mm. quality and performance and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and at least that's that's what I noticed. The more I went towards lead developer, the less I was coding and the more I was helping others, mentoring others, helping them improve yeah. uh, in, instead of doing all the work myself. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's also an important aspect of being like a lead developer uh, is trying to to let others grow as well and basically make yourself obsolete. That's exactly. my goal most of the time. And yeah. uh, I really enjoyed it if uh, some of the, the the colleagues I had in my team uh, ended up with their own team as a lead developer. I mean, then uh, you've achieved it. They basically became yeah, more or less the same as you. And yeah. They can do their own thing now and uh, you can help others or they take over from you and you can join another team. Um, I think that's that's a really important aspect to, to share your knowledge and, and to help improve others after you, of course, have some years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really like that you're kind of paying it forward, right? And yeah. Allowing others uh, to grow at the same that you did, mm-hmm. right? And, and you can then allow others to grow and it kind of spreads forward 
Um, and it's just a, a great win-win for everyone, mm -hmm. right? You learn by teaching uh, and others learn by getting taught, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but even the, the thing you laid out, just to step back, um, in kind of experimenting, right? Seeing if things work out for you. Um, I think there should always be room within an organization for that. But is there kind of a, a time frame for that? Do you, would you say like six months, try it out, see if it works, or maybe a year? Because when I talk to people, they're very much like, oh, I'm in this role now, and I, I want to do this at least for two years. And it, for me, like I was always like, I want more, I want it faster. Yeah. So two years sounds like a lot, basically. But they already have kind of their, um, they're more comfortable with two years, let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Is there like a good time frame from your experience? I think that really differs. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, for instance, if you do consulting, you have some people who work for one customer for like, I don't know, a couple of weeks yeah. or, or maybe half a year. And I had colleagues who worked at the same um, customer for like 11 years. Then I was like, but why are you working at a consultancy club if you stay so long at a customer? Yeah. You could have joined them directly then. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's really someone's preference. Um, I would say if you like it, why, why wouldn't you do it longer? I mean, of course, you can try something else and maybe you like that as well. Yeah. Um, but it, it differs a bit. As long as you have, I think, uh, you're interested in it and it's exciting and you're like, okay, this is what I want to do now. Um, and I, I also think it, it might differ in certain um, times in your life. Uh, mm. For instance, when I, I was younger, uh, I worked a lot of hours, did a lot of things uh, also uh, outside of my normal working hours. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, you get a partner, you get kids or, or other hobbies, and then it tunes down a little bit because yeah, you have to keep some balance somehow. Yeah. Um, so I think the most important thing is that you still have fun at it. <laughs> How long it takes, yeah, yeah. it's I think uh, up to you. I love that answer. I love that answer. As long as it's good for you, then... then Mm -hmm. Why care what everyone else does, right? Yeah. Yeah, you already touched upon kind of uh, doing things outside your day-to-day -day work, right? And we've already touched upon more of the, the soft skills aspect, uh, even on this show mm -hmm. in a lot of episodes. But if we're talking about the hard skills, right? And, and let's say you're a, a developer day-to-day. -day, um, if I'm applying to other jobs, people ask me, what, what kind of personal projects do you do in your own time? Do you have some, some pages you've made or, or stuff like that? And I'm like, man, I'm so focused on my developer work day to day, I don't, I don't really contribute uh, to either my personal projects or, or to like open source stuff or, or create mm. something in that way. Um, I do more content creation. Basically, that's why this podcast is there as well. Uh, but what are some of the more hard skills things that you can do? Um, yeah, I think you have various options. And again, I think it's, it's looking at something that uh, is quite close to you where mm. you feel comfortable. But, but of course, it will be a bit out of your comfort zone. I find it really annoying term comfort zone, but <laughs> um, it, it's something you're not used to. For instance, when I was asked for this podcast, I was like, yeah, should I do it? I've never done it before. Yeah. Will I like it? And, and then I was like, yeah, why bother? I mean, just do it. And if I don't like it, it's my last podcast, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's it's a matter of trying again. So um, I think when, when we started, mm, yeah, we, we tried different things. And uh, I tried, for instance... Uh, bit of open source so mm. i maintained some some packages for chocolati which is an installer for for microsoft uh, packages yeah uh, and, and i maintained the uh, java installers for that um and you can do the coding part so you can work on java frameworks commit stuff to spring or commit to the documentation of spring or do something like i did which is maybe a bit more scripting and, and not really coding yeah um uh, but I have done other things as well, such as uh, speaking at conferences or starting smaller with within the company first, uh, giving presentations for the team to try and help them with new topics or yeah. things we wanted to investigate. Um, and so I think that that's really broad. And, and, and at first, maybe you're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to do that, but uh, just start small. Start with just doing things within your team uh, then maybe within the company, uh, we had lunch sessions or however you want to call them. Yeah. It's low level. You, you know most of the people there. It's it's more comfortable. Although I have to say, I had colleagues who were really critical. Yeah. Uh, so often in company presentations, I got more difficult questions than at a <laughs> conference. So yeah. it's not always true, but it, it gives more of a familiar feeling, I think. 
So that's a nice way to, to get started with stuff. Just start small. Uh, I, I didn't start with everything at once. I think when I started, I started a little bit with speaking. Mm. Um, my manager encouraged me back then, like, hey, do, don't you want to speak at uh, bigger events like JFOL and DevOx and Java One? Because those were the biggest uh, back then and most interesting for our company. And I said, like, yeah, I can try that. But if I don't have any experience on my resume speaking on conferences, the yeah. chances that I'm selected are quite slim. Uh, so I proposed to him, like, yeah, can I submit to some other smaller conferences and try that first? And I can put that on my resume. Yeah. I got some experience speaking for maybe a bit smaller audiences at conferences before you go to the bigger ones. Yeah. Um, and so my first conference was in Croatia, close to the beach, which was actually, I think, the best location for a conference I've ever been. Yeah, very cool. Um, uh, funnily enough, I had uh, two sessions accepted at once, which was even more scarier than having to do one. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, a tip is, if, if you want to do things like that, it's, it's good if you have multiple topics that you can submit because then a program committee for a conference can can select one of them. Uh, the downside is that you might have multiple sessions. Yeah, so be like prepared both. for that. <laughs> and That's after awesome. that, it basically grew a bit organically because you speak to people there. And uh, later I started helping, for instance, in the Java magazine, um, uh, to get articles and review articles and things like that. I started yeah. helping program committees for conferences to select speakers and things like that. So it, it gradually grew. And I think one thing also important with those things is um, sometimes it's work-related, so you do it during your working hours. Sometimes or maybe more like fun. Uh, and then you have to balance it with your other activities, of course, sporting and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. uh, I've had periods where I hardly did any sport. I was just working and then doing other fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's good to keep a healthy balance with that again, because uh, a lot of people, when they, they pick up too, too much, you might get a burnout. So it's also good that after a while you evaluate like, hey, I'm now doing these and these things. What do I really like? And yeah. uh, maybe I should stop doing some of them. Because if you start Speaking publicly, you don't have to do that until you're like 67 or whenever your pension starts. I mean, you can do it for a couple of years, then stop with it, maybe start again after a while. Um, I mean, it's it's something you choose to do. It's not an obligation. Exactly. Uh, unless, of course, it's part of your function and your yeah. manager expects it. But. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I really like the mindset of just starting small, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then seeing if it works for you. Uh, and even letting it snowball, right? You do one talk and then you're on a stage somewhere doing a bunch of conferences. Yeah. Uh, but I like that you mentioned what's important there is to then still reflect if that's what you like, mm -hmm. right? Because you, st you start by trying it out to see if you actually like it and it can snowball and you can end up somewhere and you might like it, but is that your passion, right? Or do you still want to experiment, switch gears uh, and try other things out, right? You always have the room, I feel like, and, and we're very lucky to have that to try things out, yeah. right? whether it's speaking on a conference, whether it's doing more knowledge sharing within the team, even coaching and, and mentoring, it's going to be on the job, can you maybe be outside of the job now? We have so much room to kind of experiment in that way. I think we're very lucky to, to do that, basically. But to, to get back to the kind of career in coding, right? one of the uh, terms I see on the market now is besides kind of the technology labels, right? Golang, engineer, even C Sharp or Java, you also have to have that full stack label. Uh, and to me, it encompasses quite a lot, right? You need to be expert in, in front end as well as back end. Uh, and even with the cloud or the operations mindset that's there now, it's a whole package, basically. Uh, what do you think of the, the full stack label? Is that kind of a valid thing to ask from people or is it a label that's just slapped on there to make someone seem more impressive? Um, it, it depends a bit, of course, everything depends. It depends a bit on the people. Some some developers are really good and, and they pick up a lot of technologies quickly and yeah. manage to keep up to date with all of them. Mm. Uh, some spend a lot of time on it, maybe also in their free time to keep up to date and learn everything. Uh, but in general, I think it's it's too much. Uh, if, if I look at my own experience, uh, so it started with full stack and then you get DevOps. So you're a full stack DevOps developer. And yeah. then now you're a full stack DevSecOps developer. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know what, what the latest term is uh, now, but uh, it's adding and adding stuff. And, and, and that's possible. But what you get is people who are basically good at doing hello world and a lot of things and, and yeah. don't have the in-depth knowledge of, for instance, the Java framework and, and what goes wrong. So... Uh, as long as they can Google it and everything is fine, there's no issue. But uh, if all hell breaks loose, who, who's going to fix your issue? Yeah. That that will be uh, a challenge because you no longer have specialists. Uh, 
another term a couple of years ago was T-shaped. I'm, mm. I'm a bit more fan of that. Uh, it's a bit of a weird name, uh, and I'm not a big fan of terms, but <laughs> I, I think it's good to have like a base in something mm. where you're like really good in, you focus on that, but you also can do some other tricks. So yeah. that if your team member is maybe ill or he's busy, uh, you can help maybe with some operations or maybe you can help with some security stuff. Um, uh, so uh, maybe you have a big background as a Java developer and you know a little bit of uh, front-end and maybe a bit of ops. Yeah. And somebody else is more a front-ender and knows a little bit about Java. and uh, So that way you can nicely spread it. Uh, yeah. I, I've seen it in companies where they forced basically uh, everyone to be more full stack. Mm. It, it didn't really work because, for instance... We had one guy who was a full-time tester. Yeah. And we needed that because we had chain tests, performance tests, and stuff like that. So he did useful work uh, the entire week, uh, helped us really good. We were really satisfied with him. Yeah. But then he get, uh, he was told by the company, like, yeah, you need to start programming, else you will be fired because we want everyone to program. Yeah. So what happened? Uh, we had to do his testing work yeah, exactly. because he needed to program and we needed to help him with his programming because <laughs> he was not an expert in programming. So basically, the team came almost to a standstill, yeah. especially because it was at that time, I think, three people who at once needed to start coding. Mm. And that's, I think, undoable. Yeah. It, it's good to know multiple tricks so that if someone is ill, you don't have to wait a week before he's back, um, but still look at yeah, how can we efficiently work within a team. And if someone is efficiently working in a week, doing one thing the entire week, that's perfectly fine for me. He's good at it. Yeah. Um, others don't have to pick it up every week again. So um, I think we should be careful with it. it. It's good to now and then give people like responsibilities. Mm. Like if, if I have junior developers and I know they're good in front-end, I'm not that good in front-end stuff. Uh, so I, I give them the responsibility to do that. And if they have questions, simply come to me. Yeah. Uh, and, and speak with other front-end developers within the company and stuff like that. Uh, so give them some responsibilities, but not that one person do everything. That's... A really single point of failure you get. Uh, and I think it's really difficult to keep up with all the technologies. It's going so quickly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, more and more, basically. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think people are able to do that, but to a certain degree, right? Yeah. And I like that you say it depends. Depends on the person, depends on their skill level, mm -hmm. uh, probably even their experience, right? Because some things you just learn yeah. by having someone seen do that. And you're like, oh, I'll take that with me. Um, and you'll remember, like, oh, I've seen this before, so I can I can fix that in that way, yeah. right? But a team is kind of, well, they're they're a bunch of puzzle pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And if they fit together well, uh, that's how how you have a well operating team, basically. Yeah. That's how you, how you have a beautiful picture. Um, but if you have a puzzle piece that's missing, then how do you find the the missing puzzle piece, basically, while either recruiting or as a team figuring out uh, what what do we need? Do we need someone that has more testing skills or leveraging the back end or, or looking more at architecture uh, or even doing more stakeholder management nowadays. I think it's very hard to figure that out within your team uh, and then getting the right person even because everyone's skill set's so different. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a good question. I think uh, uh, it depends a bit indeed on, on what work you have. And you, as long as you have people more in, in a fixed role instead of full stack, yeah then it's a bit easier to notice because you know that person is getting a lot of work mm -hmm. uh, and he has to ask others to help him. Then you know, okay, maybe we need someone else with more or less his main skills. Yeah. Uh, if everyone is doing full stack, it's it's difficult or more difficult to see uh, where the work is in. Uh, but still, you could look at like your planning and see like, yeah, what are we doing mainly? Are we mainly building backend yeah. applications or mainly doing stuff on front end or are we spending a lot of time on on testing and operations because i noticed that in in a lot of teams uh the development often wasn't the challenge it was mainly operations and everything around it getting approvals and stuff like that which was uh, a lot of a challenge yeah uh, and i think it also it helps if you have at least one or two guys in the team who are willing to do some stuff that's not directly their work yeah uh, i've also seen teams where people were really strict like one developer who said, like, I don't write tests. Mm. Yeah, and nowadays, I mean, that's that's really strange, yeah, I think. Off. But even back then, I was like, you get paid a hell of a lot of money mm. and you only want to do one trick and that's it. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't want you to be like a full stack developer, but uh, you can do something else. If, if uh, you maybe have some more time left and, and we have some more work, then you can easily split the work. 
Yeah. Um, and if you have some people in your team who are, who are willing to do that, I think that that works easy. And um, it also helps if you um, can upfront somehow select people who fit well together. But that's, yeah. that's always difficult. Uh, I know we we tried to do that in the past, and sometimes we were lucky that we simply had a group who who clicked together. For instance, I was in a team once where uh, we had one guy who was really technical. Yeah. Um, he had quite a challenge if he needed to implement a normal feature because then he saw all kinds of problems that could arise and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but let him, letting him fix stuff uh, on compiler level and, and byte level or network level, he was really, really good at that. Nice. Uh, so when we had stories and, and we were selecting who would do what, um, it was really easy. He got the, the annoying stuff we didn't want to do. <laughs> and we got the other stuff, which he wasn't really comfortable in doing. Um, yeah. and so sometimes you get it automatically. I know we also tried a bit on selecting those skills for a team, but often what you see is hey, you don't always have the skills available. People are still on other projects and stuff yeah. like that. So it, it's difficult to get like an ideal team, I think. Uh, but as long as people are, are willing to help, I think that helps a lot already. Yeah, it's all about that collaboration, basically, yeah. because together you can solve a lot of problems mm-hmm. in that way, right? And you can fixate on, well, this is this is just my skill. Uh, but if you're not a sponge and, and willing to learn what other people are doing, then you're going to be stuck, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're going to be that one-trick pony, basically. And yeah. if that trick fails, then well, you're kind of screwed, right? Because then you're kind of out of your place and it's probably time to, to look elsewhere. I think it's mm-hmm. very important to hire people that have a mindset and they're just hungry to learn, right? There are sponges and that can absorb information, but still have their preference and kind of their speciality, uh, the thing you laid out in the kind of T-shaped thing, yeah. right? Because you still want to be kind of expert in, in either one or two domains, right? But still have kind of that general overview mm-hmm. uh, and being able to fill in when someone else is ill or even leaves the company, right? Because leaving the company is kind of a, a doom scenario. If that guy who was very good at the technical things, left the company. You would have kind of a gap in your team then, basically, which you would have to fill uh, with someone who would have equal skill level. That's kind of hard to do. Yeah, and I think you mentioned uh, yeah, you need people who are eager to learn. On the other side, that's, I think, also a challenge because mm. people who are eager to learn will quicker leave the team okay. because they, they learned the trick. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've had it in the past as well, where we build applications, and after like the third one, it was like, yeah, technically it's every time time the same. It's just like the different front end and a few different REST endpoints, but for the rest, it's the same. I could predict when we started what issues we would get yeah. along the road. Um, so if you're really eager to learn, you probably hop a bit more, and that's uh, I think also something that's that's tricky nowadays. I, I understand it because I do it myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but f- for really good teams, it's it's better if they stay together a bit longer, like a couple of years. Uh, if, if team members switch like every couple of months, you never get like the the uh, the really good dynamic where you know each other, where you can simply sur- shout at each other and and things like that. Where it's more more like friendship and and collaboration. Uh, yeah. And you know what everyone likes and. Uh, how you can divide stuff or if you don't uh, if you face an issue you know who you can ask things and and things like that yeah Um, so i think that's also a challenge nowadays in it because there's so much demand people keep on switching and it's it's hard uh, if you look from a company uh, perspective to get a really good functioning team yeah Um, and i i also think it, it differs a bit if you uh, work directly for a company because then often you have one tech stack that you need to learn and mm-hmm. that will stay there for a couple of years. Yeah. Or if you work as a consultant where basically every company you go to, they have a completely different tech stack. Uh, even yeah. if you do Java, one company uses Spring, the other uses uh, Jakarta or Micronaut or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then you need to learn a lot more even. Uh, and so... Yeah, I think different places, different challenges. <laughs> yeah, and also different preferences, right? Yeah. Some people might be very fine just within the same company, right? It might be a product company, mm. kind of same tech stack, but it has its own challenges. Um, and the longer you are there, the more you learn about different domains, right? Your mental model becomes very sharp uh, in what the code base reflects and if it reflects reality or if it needs changes in that way. If you're a consultant, you kind of hop a bit more from job to job, Mm. right? And you interact with a lot more people at at clients, for example. Uh, And I think you teach more as well because your sphere of influence is basically within that team. You're the consultant. You're kind of um, an expert in a certain domain. That's why you got hired in the first place. So you're a bit more knowledge spreading. 
Uh, and then even in between, which I'm very fond of, is kind of the agency model, right? You might be within a fixed team um, and you're kind of a task force as you go to a client and fix just a big chunk of work. And that chunk of work can change, the tech stack can change, but the team kind of stays the same in that way. Aye. Yeah, but for companies, it's very interesting because there's a contrast there. Companies want stability, right? They would love mm. a great team that never changes. Uh, but people within that team want a challenge, right? They want to be able to learn if something changes on the market and it's not in the company and they want to try that out, they will probably leave to try that out, mm. right? You have room to experiment, but that's not necessarily what companies want. So I think there's a, there should be a match, right? The company should be able to allow people to experiment um, and that'll kind of glue them a bit more to the company. Yeah, and right? it helps them grow. Because if you keep the same t- team, <laughs> like, for many years, yeah, um, I, uh, you don't have like four lead developers in one team. Yeah, at least I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so it 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 basically hinders the growth. I think of the the, the more junior ones. Uh, in, in that sense, I think it's better if they they have the room to to leave after a certain period of time. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that's always a good difficult balance <laughs> to make. <laughs> exactly. But moving back to kind of. A career in coding, I think everyone will face kind of a, a decision or, or a, um, a two-way road, basically. One that's a bit more high over, more to the people side, and what's, one that's a bit more in-depth into the technical side, right? Mm-hmm. I think for you, it was a bit more high over and, and more the people side. I mean, I'm just guessing because you do a lot of conferences and a lot of uh, developer advocacy. But why, why was it more the high over uh, and not necessarily the technical side for you? Um, I think I do a bit of both. Mm. <laughs> um, so I'm still technically involved. Uh, now as a software architect, I, I try to uh, help with like more strategic decisions. For instance, we decided to go from the Vertex framework to a Spring framework. Yeah. Uh, several things we changed in our cloud setup and stuff like that. And I still hands-on help teams. So I help teams with actual the migration to the newest version of Java. I change their code base basically. Yeah. So I'm still doing uh, some hands-on uh, stuff. Uh, not really implementing like functional features at this point in time because uh, I don't have the time for it as I'm yeah, software architect for like 100 people or something like that uh, yeah. uh, with a lot of teams. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's sometimes interesting to see uh, how much something is more people related and so how much something is more technical related. Yeah. Because uh, of course, I mean, you could also do like management and that's often seen as something then, then you move really away from the code, but there are yeah. some managers who still code. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been a trainer for a while within our company, uh, which I think is also a really interesting position as a trainer or a teacher at a, at a school. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people then ask me like, yeah, yeah, so n- now you stopped coding. And I was laughing like, no, I'm coding more than I ever did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because in the years before when I was a lead developer, I also had scrum meetings and discussions and stuff like that. Uh, I had a team t- uh, which we uh, gave demos and stuff like that. When I was a teacher, I was by myself. Basically, we had some other teachers, but we were all working more or less independently, uh, maybe uh, chatting uh, once every two weeks or something like that, but that was more informal. Uh, And the rest of the time, I was basically either teaching stuff or creating new course material and creating all kinds of example code. And uh, the nice thing about that was also that it was... Uh, quite broad. If, mm. if you're working as a consultant in a company or uh, as an employee, um, uh, sometimes if you work with a technology like Spring, for instance, you only do like the REST part because the database, some other team is, is creating it and you simply call some other REST endpoints. Yeah. Um, and when you're a teacher and you teach a Spring framework, you have to teach everything. So it's it's a bit broader than uh, uh, when you work on a specific project where normally you, you use a subset of a technology. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I quite enjoyed it. And I think I programmed more than I did in the, in the years before that. Uh, nice. uh, so I can really also recommend to, to try that. Uh, if, uh, one or more trainings. Uh, most of the time I would advise... Uh, if you try something, don't try it once, but try it a couple of times. But the first time often is, is a bit of a challenge. You're really nervous for it. Yeah. In the end, most of the time, yet and these are still happy with it. But for yourself, it's the first time is always a bit of a challenge. Um, so if you do it a couple of times, you can see if you like it. And maybe do it full time or do it next to your job. It depends a bit on your possibilities. And again, if you have a bit of a big company where they both do consultancy or internal projects and they do a bit of... Uh, courses, then it's easy to do both things at the same time. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, yeah, I quite like that. And then later I did more like software architecture and um, yeah, from 
when I, I think when I was lead developer, I indeed did uh, conference talks and I wrote articles and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but it was quite a small part of my job. Mm. Uh, eventually, I did partly um, that and partly as a technical evangelist. So yeah. uh, I, I officially got some time from the company to spend on it. I think back then it was like two days a week or something like that. Mm. Uh, so I could speak at conferences and... Uh, write articles and, and do other things. And uh, I led the community for Java developers in that consultancy company for a while as well. Yeah. Uh, so I did both a bit to the outside world and also to the inside, um, uh, basically making sure that we had interesting trainings to do and uh, training curriculums for, for new starters, uh, help with marketing, with boots at conferences and stuff like that. So. Yeah. There are a lot of ways that you can do, and some involve a bit more coding, and some involve a bit less coding. It's it's just what you want. Uh, I still love coding, and uh, I spend some evenings still coding yeah. or writing an article and trying out some new framework or stuff like that. I still like to do that. Uh, nice. I'm I'm happy that there's also kind of a middle road in which you can do both. Yeah. Right. Because I I've asked this question before, and people are very much like, no, no, no. For me, it was coding all the way. I went more in depth. I specialized in quality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other way, well, I, I wanted to be uh, a bit more high over. So I started with a tech lead position, then moved into management, and now I'm kind of activating and multiplying people. And you're more like, well, I still kind of do both, right? And yeah. it depends on on where I am within a company. I can either do a lot of conferences or I can teach and, and really go in depth uh, and know my stuff, right? Because you need to know your stuff before you teach other people. Mm. What I wouldn't imagine, uh, but it makes sense the way you lay it out, is when you're in a team, a lot of your time you're aligning with other people, right? And as you mentioned, you might not be responsible for that full picture. But when you're teaching, it's just you coming up with material and you need to have that full picture to teach other people that same full picture, right? Because that full picture is going to help them along the along the line, along the road, <laughs> within a company and kind of getting that mental picture of where the company is, of their kind of theoretical mental picture in that way. Um, and then it makes sense that you're way more hands-on, way more preparing stuff um, than you would otherwise because you would be aligning with other people. Yeah. What are you doing now and, and what's kind of next for you? Um, I'm currently working as a software architect, which uh, architect is also a role where some people are like, okay, now you're gone of the technical stuff <laughs> and uh, you're yeah. in the ivory tower. Yeah. And um, I, I did some architecture work in the previous company as well. And when I joined this company, um, I also to talked to them. I said like, yeah, I still want to do stuff hands-on. So I am doubting if I would be rather like something like a lead developer or a senior developer or an architect. Yeah. And they said like, okay, we'll simply uh, let you speak to different people from the company and you can ask them whatever you want about the role. And yeah. then my most... Uh, yeah, important question was like, yeah, if I'm an architect, am I put in an ivory tower producing documents? Yeah. Or can I help teams hands on? And and my manager immediately said, no, no, no. We just make sure that you can do what you think is good for the company. Yeah. And and what helps the company forward. Um, and then I was like, yeah, that that sounds like good because if you're in a team and you focus purely on technical stuff, that, that's interesting, but it's also sometimes annoying because mm. then other people make decisions for you. Yeah. <laughs> so they decide like, yeah, we no longer do Java, we're going to do .NET, or yeah. we use this framework or that framework. And you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's the right decision. So I was mm. like, I want, I would like to be more strategically involved and more long-term involved as well, yeah. while still doing the, a bit of the more hands-on work. Of course, it's no longer full-time, because yeah, you have other responsibilities with it, um, uh, but it's possible. So as an architect, you don't have to be uh, like the, the ivory tower architect. And yeah. uh, if I sometimes look at vacancies, if you see vacancies with a lot of uh, vague terms in it, <laughs> then it's often more the ivory tower <laughs> architects. Yeah. Um, and so really pick like, uh, if you want to do that, a role um, uh, which also involves the technical part. And often yeah, I'm called a software architect. The names sometimes vary between companies as well. But I think in general, software architect is a bit more technical. Yeah. And things like solution architect, uh, they are more focusing on yeah, making the solution for um, a specific business desire. Yeah. Uh, that's often a bit less technical. So you have different roles uh, of architects uh, where you can choose from, basically. And yeah. Um, I, I still like it that I can uh, both influence long-term decisions while still yeah, feeling involved with day-to-day with -day work, basically. Yeah, what I really like from that is that your manager basically said, no, 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 
whatever you think is right is how you yeah. should fill it in, right? That's very cool because mm. then you kind of also feel empowered, like, oh, I can just try this out. I think it's this way. And you're probably right, right? Because you're right in the thick of it. Your manager is a bit more high over and more overseeing. And to get that trust and to be able to execute in your own way, I think that's very cool. Yeah, I think in general it, it helps a lot. If you have a manager who trusts in you and uh, uh, who lets you do interesting stuff yeah, uh, and, and you have an interesting team to work with, then maybe it's not like uh, I will, would maybe want to spend more time on coding and less on, I don't know, or writing PowerPoints or whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, But still it's a nice, it's almost nicely in balance and it's a nice environment. So yeah, why not stay there basically? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really like the picture that we've kind of painted here. Um, in that when you start from university, find a company where you can still grow, right? Because you mm -hmm. need to keep learning, keep trying things out, right? Either on the job uh, or at home kind of experimenting. Doesn't even need to be either technical or more high over, more people side. It can be both, right? It can be right down the middle of the lane. Uh, and even those different roles in kind of back end or front end or even full stack, try things out and see what kind of fits with you but make sure you're within a team that you can still learn from other people, mm. right? And then just try things out, see where you end up, reflect if that's still the right way for you. Um, and otherwise shift gears or, or, or just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, I, I love kind of the, the road that we've laid out. Is there anything that's missing that you still would like to share? Yeah, I think one thing that's maybe also interesting is uh, search for a company that supports you in, in improving in various ways, not only technical. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I, I spent like... Uh, um, a week in the in Vught with the uh, uh, training for English, basically. So my English wasn't bad, but I was doing a lot of uh, presentations and writing articles and was like, I think I can still improve it. And my yeah. company was like, yeah, that's part of your job. Simply do that. Uh, awesome. While it was ridiculously expensive, but uh, they gave me the room to do that. And I think... Uh, people can grow in different directions. Some need a bit more help with, with their technical work, some maybe with a bit more like social skills or convincing people or uh, how you interact with people, um, especially in a team. You need to be a bit aware of, of how other people react to you and how you should maybe communicate differently with some kind of people. Yeah. Um, uh, so make sure you, that you train in different areas and not only the technical part. Yeah, I love that, man. Thanks for coming on, Johan. Thank you. a lot of fun. <laughs> I hope you had too. Yes, definitely. Thanks for having me. <laughs> cool, man. We'll do this again sometime. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Johan Janssen, everyone. Beyond Coding. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders.